I don't want people to miss out on what they could gain from prioritizing kindness and not thinking that it's just some really sweet, cute, pie in the sky notion of niceties and let's all just be kind. You know, it's, that's not even my personality. <laughs> So I'm, I'm hoping and hopeful that people will actually say, hmm, that's a different perspective. Kindness is a superpower. Okay, I get it. Yeah, I love that. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Rock Solid with me, Crystal Fambrini, where we learn how to be our best selves, our most rock solid selves. And with us today, she's definitely someone that I have a lot of respect for. She is a super woman, a super boss, a leader. She is an ABC News correspondent, and you've seen her on Good Morning America. It's Adrian Banker. How are you? Oh, good to be with you, Crystal. Thank you so much. You know, friendliness is a really big part of being kind. So thank you for that friendly introduction. I was so excited to have you on because you have a new book out. It's called Your Hidden Superpower, The Kindness That Makes You Unbeatable at Work and Connects You with Anyone. Yes. And uh, when I saw this, I got so excited um, <laughs> and I got excited and it doesn't, you know, people think, oh, it's cutesy or silly. We were just talking about that before we started this. And kindness is so much more than that. It, kindness to me, you're being kind, you're showing compassion, you're being your best self, which is what this podcast is all about, how to be your best self. So yes. uh, how do you define kindness? Well, I say, say it in the book, kind, your kind self is your best self. You know, your kind self is the 100% authentic version of you that you always wanted to grow, to grow up to be. You know, I wrote the book at a time when I was discovering and rediscovering my superpower, my strength, my purpose. Uh, what did I really want out of life? What would fulfillment mean for me? I had a goal of writing a book and it was through kindness that really illustrated to me how much wow, it really does open great doors of opportunity. It really does position you just like GPS to help you find the course for your personal treasure map to success. And it does make you feel real because I think so many times in our journey, we lose ourselves. You know, we sometimes have put on a mask to try to either make a good impression or feel more confident or give people what they say they want or what we think they say they're wanting. And I just, the biggest parts of my life or the most successful parts of my life are because I was just real. And what is real? Real is who you really are, your kind self. When people think of kindness, you don't want them to think of, mistake it for weakness. No. Um, there's a oh huge gosh. difference with that. Yeah. Because someone can be kind and be strong. Someone can be kind and not agree with someone. People can have different outtakes on life, but you find that yes. connection of kindness which you treat them with compassion and you, I guess you would respect their opinion while still trying to, you know, convey your own. Yeah. I, you know, I, you bring up a really good point and I say, you know, kind does not mean you just sit back and let people walk all over you. Kind does not mean, you know, that you always keep quiet. Sometimes kindness speaks up. Kindness stands up for what it believes in, in different ways. And there was this particular job interview I was going on and I knew that they were going to ask me, to chat after this story was told. So I was auditioning to be a host and um, my co-host was there with me and I was tasked with listening to another a contributor's story and then I was going to share banter. You don't know what that other person thinks about your opinion and, and you don't know that it's the appropriate response. So during a job interview, while you're trying to like make this good impression, yeah. it's not that you're trying to be fake. It's just mm -hmm. why create a debate at the time you're endeavoring to get your foot in the door. And I think that we do this all the time in real life. You know, you meet somebody new at, during what used to be a cocktail hour. Now it's a Zoom cocktail or happy <laughs> hour, right? And you've never had any interaction with this person. And before you've known them for five minutes, you've already put your foot in your mouth because you're more interested in telling your side or your opinion than learning about them and listening to them and knowing who exactly it is that you're talking to. So this, this particular job interview was a great example of interpersonal relations. So I was talking to my executive coach and I said, listen, I said, I know they're going to ask me controversial questions. I know they're going to want me to talk about this controversial story. What 
is the answer. I mean, I don't want to be phony. I don't want to just clam up. I don't want to give some weird response that seems out of left field or seems tone deaf. And he said to me, you know what? Your job is not to give your opinion. Your job is to inspire and provoke to new thought. And when he said that, I thought it was one of the most profound things I'd ever heard anybody say. I said, what if every conversation we had, mm -hmm. we cared less about trying to make our point known? We already know what we think. Mm -hmm. you know, see, so don't get it twisted, anybody listening. Like, I'm not saying that you can't have your own voice or your own opinion. You obviously already do. But what if we were more invested in listening? That's the empathetic. That's the compassionate response. Mm -hmm. And finding out what they think and their background and their story and why they believe what they believe. We already know what we know. Them telling us what they know could contribute to what we know and actually build a greater platform or a greater confidence in what we already believe is true, or it could help give us a new perspective. And so um, I don't remember verbatim exactly what I said, but I remember contemplating it and not knowing ahead of time what I would say. But the only thing I knew was that I would inspire and provoke to new thought. And they came up to the desk, shared their story, turned to me, asked me a question that I could have taken down one path. And instead, I actually think I might have responded with another question. And that helped them to look good. I set them up, though. I didn't ask them a question that was totally irrelevant or random. I, I've learned in working with many, many different kinds of personalities and people in the journalism and broadcasting industries that I could sit here and look like I'm really smart. But when I make you look good, I automatically look good. So again, serving the purpose of being my best self, I already know what I know. I already know my giftings and talents. But what is the harm if I set you up to look like your best self on that big stage, on camera, in a conversation, on a panel? When I do, I automatically look good. Mm -hmm. The kindness that we show to other people shines a spotlight on their greatness while never diminishing our own brightness. And that's why kindness is powerful. That's just one reason. Yeah. And you, you write about that in the book, the win-win strategy. And that's an example yes. of the win-win strategy where everyone yes. wins and you don't have to agree with the other person. I think that's a really important, um, you know, something to point out with people. And especially now with what's going on in the news, with what's going on in social media and how we're all in these echo chambers, and people, you know, are at home, they're not working. And it's unfortunate that they have resorted to attacking each other on social media. Yeah. If someone doesn't believe what you believe, you go after them. And I, I think that, wow, what if we could change that with kindness? So mm -hmm. kindness, which is such a simple, basic emotional intelligence tool is actually now could be potentially radical because yes. what if someone is attacking you on Facebook and you choose not to fight back? you choose to have a dialogue, you, you choose to be kind to hear them, uh, you know, in a different, in a way, like what you were talking about with the audition, with co-hosting, people could kind of take that in their own experience with social media, right? There's an opportunity because they're on their own platform yes. um, to let that person have a voice and maybe connect, connect with them. Because at the end of the day, we all are all living on in the same world together. We're all human beings. We all yeah. want the same things. Um, I, I've been having discussions with my friends about that because I post a lot of, um, I tried, I just post the news. I don't think that it's, you know, controversial, but people take it controversial. Um, and I point that out to people. I'm like, I'm just po posting what's going on today because the world is moving so fast. I think it's important that, you know, you know, when you are out for the last three hours, there's been some huge thing that's happened. So, um, and then people will post some things and I'm surprised with what they post. And then other friends of mine say, why do you engage in those types of conversations with them? They're just, it's worthless. You know, they have their view. You're wasting your time. And I'm thinking, well, I'm trying to engage to have a connection, but is that maybe going too far? Like, when do you put up, you know, the walls or when do you stop communication with someone, even when you're trying to be kind? I think that it's really important to go with peace. Like, you know... In my life, I've had that funny feeling or that anxiety feeling. And some people say that that fear is like an indication that you should move forward because mm. like you're breaking a barrier, right? You're, you're stepping out, you're going into new territory and there are butterflies that can come along with that. But there are times in our lives, in our relationships, in our conversations where 
we felt that little small hint of lack of peace. Like, maybe I shouldn't say that. And then we go ahead and say it anyway. <laughs> and it backfires and we get into a fight or, you know, and this is on social media or in, in real life, IRL. Um, I think we all need to be better in tune with that little voice. Mm -hmm. And I say that kindness provides a sixth sense intuition because so many people don't know the sound of that little voice inside. So many people don't know how to follow their conscience, whether it comes to dating or whether it comes to speaking out loud or whether it comes to, you know, knowing what to do next in their career. And I've used kindness towards others and following warm impulses to develop this muscle memory so that I know better what to do with my own life. It's, it's something that I've noticed. I'm more sensitive to other people. I'm more situationally aware. So then I'm more situationally aware about me, you know, when I'm supposed to say yes or no. And so even in interactions with social media, when I decide to post, it's because I really contemplated it. You know, post like you're famous, you know, do things like you're already famous, like you have an entourage, like you have a team of people who are helping you, like you have a publicist, have somebody that you elect to say, you know what, what do you think about this post? And let them read it or let them check out what you're gonna say beforehand. It's not because you're a baby and you need a babysitter. It's because we all need accountability. And in this world today, what you say and what you post lives forever. Mm -hmm. And we're not taking that seriously enough. This is not some virtual reality. What is online is as real as the person you are looking at in the mirror, is as real as the person who is going to bed with you at night. And it creates and crafts a reputation over time where, as we've seen, people can go back and look at what you posted and what you said and remind you of it. And so what I tell people is don't just post what you feel. Don't just post what you think, if, especially if you have not honed that intuition that, again, I believe kindness can develop. Allow somebody in your life who has veto power, who can say, you know what, maybe it's best you don't post that. And a lot of times we post things in an emotional state. We see something that enrages us. We see something that makes us sad. We see something that makes us want to react. And I believe that we need to see social media as that initial handshake that we would have with someone we met in person, which we don't handshake anymore. We, we post something and they respond to us in a message on LinkedIn or on Instagram or on Twitter. And it's the first impression. And so can you say to yourself genuinely that this is your first impression that you want to give someone when you make that post? Not, not your initial post when you just opened your Instagram account, because I'm talking to people who already have accounts. I'm talking about every time you post, you are reintroducing yourself to your followers and you're reintroducing yourself to someone who's never seen you before. Is that what you want to say as the first impression? If you're at peace about that, rock on, be rock solid, do that. But if you're not, then I would have somebody in your life who has veto power and I would allow them to tell me no, even if I felt like it was right. You do talk about this in the book as well, like create a schedule, remind yourself to have more kindness in your life. So, you're, yeah. so you know, you mentioned it a couple minutes ago about how kindness is like a muscle and you get to work it out. How did you learn that technique or who did you hear that from? That was scheduling me. kindness in, really? That was me. I, yeah. I mean, my, my mentor gave me the idea to write mm -hmm. the book on kindness because he knew how intentionally I practiced it. I am not perfect. I have made lots of mistakes like all of us have. I have mm -hmm. done things that I regret and said things that I regret. And really over the course of my career, I've seen where I was kind and I've seen where I was unkind. Being mm -hmm. so intentional about kindness has revealed areas where I still need to grow in kindness. And that's what I want people to see. It's, it's a journey. It's a lifestyle. It's an identity. It's not you know, it's just like working out. Like people who work out believe it works. They believe there's a benefit to their mind, their body, and their emotional realm. And I would never give it up. If you talk to somebody who's working out, if they gave it up, it's because something happened that took them out of working out, which they know is not best for them. Mm -hmm. And for me, with kindness, I'm constantly growing in it. And it is a muscle memory thing because initially you are scheduling kindness because you are so not used to being in a kind flow. I mean, you're not even conscious of kindness. You're conscious of your to-do list. You're conscious of your job. But for me, when I'm conscious of kindness, when I have regularly scheduled appointments of giving and doing for others, it keeps my head in the game. And eventually you really don't need to schedule it anymore. It's kind of like, oh, this is what we do. This is how we breathe. This is our knee jerk response to anything in life is kindness and compassion. And so scheduling it first, 
and then adopting it as a lifestyle eventually becomes your highest self, your identity. And I love how you said, you know, you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. No one is perfect, you know, which is the beauty, the beauty of it. We all have our imperfections, which makes us unique and special. And we're all striving to be kind, but sometimes you, you aren't and you mess up. Right. And instead of being, I, I heard this a couple years ago and it really resonated with me. Instead of being your, your worst enemy, be your best friend. So you mm. also get to be kind to yourself. So when you do yeah. mess up and you are unkind to someone, you get to say loving thoughts to yourself, you know, like you can do better next time. You know, yes. you can apologize. You can always take responsibility. You can own it. You know, you learn from your mistakes, you choose acceptance, you awareness that you're not perfect. And you know, you go on. Um, so I just, I love this conversation and you know, you mention it a bit in the book about your mom. Your mom has a huge presence in your life. And she said, what was the, the exact quote? It's about, you know, people watching you or yeah somebody's always that? watching you somebody is always yeah. watching you even when you can't see them what a smart mom to say that to some you know to your kid she couldn't keep her eye on all seven of us so she had to remind me that there was somebody creeping in the bushes no I don't, yeah no it's she just like somebody's gonna be watching out for you i don't know who it is but you're gonna be seen you know and it yeah. just, it, it was preparing me for the world that we live in now where everybody has a camera and a microphone in their purse or their you know, pocket. Mm -hmm. Now, do you have stories? I'm, I'm sure you do. Um, when you were little, like you just seem like you, you were born with kindness, you know, in your DNA, <laughs> no. with your family, like, you know, no, no, Something that's taught. You think I think, no, I think, I think, okay. How, let me rewind. I believe we were all born to be kind. I believe it's in our DNA. Yeah. I talk about that in the book. We are kind, right. uh, by nature. However, I believe that life can beat you up because life is not fair. Mm -hmm. disappointments are not fair uh, mistakes that happen to you or in the lives of people who influence you greatly are not fair mm -hmm. you know there is not always a happy ending in every relationship and so and you don't get the promotion that you were deserving of or you know the, all these things that happen to us in life affect us and and can dent our armor you know that mm -hmm. confident armor that we're supposed to all have and that kindness goes away and so when I, when you asked me, you seem like you were born kind. I say, yes, we're all born kind. At the same time, yeah. there were unkind things that happened in life that could have caused me to take a different path, like mm -hmm. all of us. But um, it was just, I don't know what it was. I don't know what, again, you know, thank goodness for an executive coach who inspired me to write it, but he was really on me about being empathetic towards my crew. Um, and I was really aware of people who weren't kind in the business, mm -hmm. but I was aware of people who weren't kind everywhere. You know, I'd watch the way somebody would check you out at the cashier at the uh, store. I would watch, I would just study people. And I realized that for me, in my unkind moments, I created a ripple effect in that person's life and in the life of anybody who saw it. Mm -hmm. And so in this quest to be kind, I realized I picked up certain me mechanisms that have helped me be successful. And um, one of them was if somebody yells at you on the job or in life, you don't have to yell back, mm -hmm. but you have to realize that something bad might have happened to them that precipitated that response. And it happened for me at work. Um, I tell that story quite often. Somebody yelled at me. I wanted to snap back. I kept my mouth shut even though I wanted to say something. Found out his mother had died the night before. And so it became a trigger mechanism. Anytime anybody raised their voice or was rude to me, somebody must have died. I mean, it wasn't like I said it out loud. I didn't tell anybody. I didn't talk to that person. I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. Somebody died. It was, it was my internal mechanism to keep me conscious that I was not in that person's limelight. They were dealing with some big thing that was taking over their life that affected how they communicated with me and not to take it, I should not take it personal. Mm -hmm. In that split second, I needed something to remind me when somebody would snap. And when I would snap, I, had, I came up with one for myself because there were times when I just wanted to light into somebody because life is life, right? And then the thought occurred to me, don't act like it's your last day on the planet. Cause you know, people will say that it acts like it's your last day on earth. Like live your life. Like you don't have tomorrow and then you'll have this wonderful <laughs> life. I'm like, I don't want to think about myself dying tomorrow, but if I think of somebody else who I'm not pleased with dying tomorrow, that helps me 
raise my level of compassion for them. Because if somebody's on their deathbed, I'm going to Mm -hmm. come and sit with them, hold their hand, bring them their favorite meal, bring them their favorite anything. Like, what do you want me to do? I'll do it for you. I've done it before. And so I could, I could trigger that compassion for somebody who was sitting in front of me, standing in front of me, acting differently than I wanted. Um, because we need something bigger than that moment to arrest us from having an unkind response. And death for me was a great trigger in a positive direction, as morbid as that might sound. No, I, I love that. And also, you know, what you're saying, you said a lot of great things just, just then. Um, one was about you're detaching yourself from the situation. You're not taking everything personal. If right. someone is giving you negative energy or screaming at you and you, you stop and you think, and that's emotional intelligence, that's EQ, you know, what's happening to this person mm-hmm. because I'm not responsible for how they're acting right now, which is huge. Yeah. So many people don't understand that. So many people think, oh no, what did I do to make, you know, to make this person yell at me? You know, why do I deserve this? What happened? I, you know, and then it right. just, you lower your energy, you become small, but you, you know, your, your tools and your toolbox is your stand in your power and you know who you are and you, and you go, okay, wait, I'm confident. I'm, I'm aware something's not right. I'm going to allow this to happen. Doesn't mean that I accept it though. And then you, you, you respond back with compassion, which is a beautiful tool for communicating with anyone and anywhere in the world. Yeah. And I also, when you stay calm, when somebody is responding that way Mm -hmm. and not take it personal, like a personal attack on you, then you can keep the clarity that is required to say, okay, now let me examine myself. You know, have I done anything that I could adjust Mm -hmm. in order to be more effective in this communication? Mm -hmm. Is there something I missed? You know, maybe it was that they, you know, have kids that are getting into trouble right now and they're stressed out. I mean, again, not putting it on anybody. It's just, what can I do better and learn from this? And what can I do better in terms of not putting fuel on this fire that's already raging? Yeah, and I see all your books behind you. I love that. Yes. yes. I love that. How long did it take you to write this book? About eight months. Oh, that's fast. Uh, fast writing, but then there's the whole year long copy editing process because whenever you involve a team, like there's other voices in the room and mm-hmm. you start to question even some of your own writing and especially when you're a first time author. And so I tell people like it's, it can come down, you know, download fast but then there's the process. And what I learned so much from this process, I am so grateful for my publisher, so happy, but I just, I, I now am more confident in knowing when I have peace about something and I I need to keep it in no matter what anybody says, which happened. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I need to be flexible and say, you know what, they are right. Like, let's work on that, which happened. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So yeah, it's a team effort, but you do have to hold your own in terms of what you know is right because you are the expert when you're writing your own book. And is this, do you see yourself writing more books? I'm already working on my second and third. Yeah. Oh, what are, are they about kindness or? One of them will definitely be about kindness. The other one I'm waiting to talk about, but yes, the kindness conversation will continue. Mm-hmm. Um, this is nothing that's going to ever leave me. Um, I think that I'll need to work on it for the rest of my life. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, I think the world will need it for the rest of my life and longer. So yeah. I know you talk about acts of kindness, um, which is great to start with, but you really want to become kindness. You want to be, yes. you know, 24 mm-hmm. seven. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I say, you know, I kind of made a, a light joke like, Oh, that was so fast for you to write the book. But really you took years studying this. You've worked with, you know, a coach for a long time. So yes, you've been very years. aware. Of, yeah. And now you are ready to share that with the world, which is exactly. Cool. Yeah. It has been a, and what is cool is when you realize that other people saw you working on it. Yeah. Not that you need credit that believe me, I don't No, I'm trying to make kindness famous. That's what I'm trying to do. Well, and you're here but, to inspire. So if yes. other people are noticing your actions, you're essentially inspiring them, which is beautiful. And then, and the fact that it works, mm-hmm. you know, I know it works. I know it works because the book's still helping me and I wrote it. Like I read the book and I'm like, Oh man, I need to make an adjustment in kindness. I need to turn the kindness knob up a little more, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, But also just hearing the stories of people who are like six years ago, this happened and 15 years ago, this happened and 10 years. And it's, it is something that I've been very much um, keeping in my front view 
so that even without a job, if I, you know, wasn't working, which is not going to happen, I love working, but um, I could know my purpose no matter what happened. Ups and downs happen in your career. Ups and downs are shared in this book. And I had to keep kindness as an identity at the forefront because when they take, you know, when you get laid off or when the deal doesn't happen or when you get fired or when you have a divorce or when, you know, your house is foreclosed upon or when you lose your company or any number of things, the kids all move out and it's an empty nest. What do you have to anchor yourself in? I really was like, what's a universal thing in crisis that we all can anchor ourselves in? When we don't know who we are, where we are. My mom sometimes would forget our names because she was trying to call, who are you? Like, come here. And sometimes I feel like we're, we're that way. It's like, who am I? Where am I? What am I? Mm -hmm. And I am kind is the one thing that is resounding and I know it. And it's like, okay, I am kind. So what am I going to do that's kind? How am I going to fulfill that kind identity by acting kind? Okay, who can I help right now? What problem can I solve? And taking a step in that direction. It automatically puts you in orbit. It automatically puts you on your own specific treasure map to the gold, the gold at the end of the rainbow. It's just a matter of deciding who you really are. Yeah. Kindness and your, is your identity. Yeah. In your um, first chapter of your book, you talk about how kindness really opened the doors and allowed mm -hmm. you to, you know, go into a, a huge, a great job offer, right? Yes. Which is Yeah. yeah. Um, that was just four and a half years ago now, a little less than four and a half years ago. So yeah, I was working in Dallas, Fort Worth, loved my job, loved my coworkers, but had this passion to go to the next level. And um, a woman who'd known me my entire career called up another woman who happened to be the general manager of a station mm -hmm. and said, I need you to work with Adrian Banker. I've never heard her say a bad word about anybody. Now I didn't know this happened until afterwards when I got offered yeah. the job. Like, I can teach you how to be a better writer. I can teach you how to be a better reporter. I can teach you all this stuff, but I can't teach kind. I can't teach nice. And we need more people like you in this business. So I got the job based on a reputation because I really did work on that. You know, I had, um, had conversations with people that weren't perfect, that were, you know, gossipy and stuff. And I remember feeling bad. Like, I can't be like that. Like, first of all, it's wrong. Second of all, word spreads quickly in this business. Third of all, what's the point? And so I made a rule for myself as a young, young reporter, I will not gossip. And um, that's the reputation that got me 10 years later into this great job, which four months later, I was introduced to the network, which is what I wanted. Yeah. Well, congratulations. I love that. My, my agent is a Babette Perry. Have you heard of Babette? I don't know if you know, but I Perry. feel like I have heard that name because it's such a unique name. Yeah. I feel like I have heard. I've never been repped by her, but I, I, yeah. I know that name. I feel like she's, she's a legend as a broadcast news um, agent. And, you know, I've been with her for over a decade now. And why I signed with her is because I thought she was so kind. Like, you know, you meet, you meet with all these agents and she just struck me as just, you know, she could be my mom. She could be my friend. She was just a good person. Um, and she always has these annual events with, women that she represents. And I love going because all the women are like her, just really good, yeah. solid, hardworking, kind people. Um, and a couple years ago, and I'm not sharing this to toot my, ho my horn in, in any way. Don't she, even explain she, yourself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. She just said to me, you know, you're so kind, you know, and she said, there's no one like kind like you. And she laughed mm. and I knew why she was laughing. It's because there was a, a job opening and I, um, she called me about it and I recommended my friend. <laughs> <laughs> and my wow. and she was like, who would do that? And I was like, well, I think she'd be perfect for it. How could I not, you know? Um, and it struck me because when she said that to me and I, you know, I talked to my, some of my other hosting rep and reporting friends. Um, I said, I believe in abundance. I believe, you know, I'm not, I don't believe in scarcity. Um, I just thought it was so perfect for my friend and I want the women around me to shine. Um, I'm not trying to hold anyone back. So that's, you know, how I live my life. And I didn't even that's realize great. that I was being kind. I was just, just thought it was for the best, you know, you were being um, you. Yeah. yeah. So I think a lot of people, you know, do kind things all the time and they're not even conscious of it. So when you, you take time to reflect on what you do do in your daily life, you might be surprised like people that are listening, how kind you are, you know, <laughs> and, well, that's and how what, that affects your life so positively. I think it's, it's in honing it and knowing its power, because I think that 
you're right. Kind people don't necessarily want attention for being kind. And that's something that is kind of like the problem in a sense. Like, I don't want you to feel like you're self, uh, you're, you're so self aggrandizing where it's like, look at me, I'm kind. Mm -hmm. I want you to see that your ambition or desire for kindness is needed in this world. So share what you can, you know, share about, you know, your friend being perfect for the job. Um, share about, you know, this nonprofit that's doing great work or your company or the heroes. Like we need to hear the good stories right now. Sure. There are a lot of things that are wrong and there are people doing things that are wrong, but there's a lot of people doing things that are right. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people helping others. There's a lot of people who are making their voice a voice of change and of kindness and of unity and of hope. And it's like, don't think of it is you tooting your own horn. Think of it as you advocating for a kinder world and making kindness famous. That's really, I, I had to settle that in myself because mm -hmm. I didn't want people to think I was tooting my own horn either. But at the same time, I'm like, I'm not ashamed to be a kind person. And I need to give these examples because I don't hear a lot of people giving practical examples for how kindness is powerful. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to hear. We, we don't just need to hear that it's sweet and kind and nice. We need to hear how it opened the door. I just reposted a, a tweet. I believe I did it. If I didn't, I'll make sure I do it. Um, this reporter at WABC had retweeted a story from New Jersey, I believe, where this woman died. Her adopted children are now responsible for the home and paying the mortgage. And so somebody with like the Parent Teacher Association found out about their plight posted a GoFundMe page online and the community came around and gave them like over $200,000 to pay off the house. Mm -hmm. And they're working on doing repairs. That's phenomenal. And I just thought, gosh, I was like, that's the kind of stuff that needs to be, you know, resounding in our ears right now. Not because it's any kind of band-aid for the problems that we're facing and the big things that are going on that are not as positive, but to keep us alive with hope because when things get overwhelming, we can emotionally shut down. Mm -hmm. And kindness keeps you hopeful. Kindness keeps your head in the game so that you can be part of the answer. You can be the problem solver that you need to be with that clarity that problem solvers have versus just feeling overwhelmed or numb or in shock because of what's going on. And that's my main thrust for kindness right now is it keeps you sane. Yeah. And if people are being overwhelmed by external circumstances, they can, you know, take control of it by going out and doing an act of kindness and by yes. helping someone else, it helps yourself. It makes you feel good. There's just, and it's a ripple effect. It's, it's a ripple effect. It's a win-win. So you feel better, but you're making the world better all at the same time. So your book came out last week and mm -hmm. what perfect timing, because I think the world needs this message now more than ever. How weird yeah. is that? How serendipitous? How, how perfect? Well, I think that there was, you know, I'm sure that there are a lot of people who are thinking about kindness more and more. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, the perspective that I'm giving is, my hope is that people will see it as more than just a good idea. It's more than just even hope, even though hope mm -hmm. is to me like oxygen right now. It's keeping us all going but that it really is powerfully linked to the most successful people in the world. I, I detail a few of the stories of people I've interviewed who talk about kindness and how it's impacted their lives and careers. Uh, I also share my personal stories of success for how I got here, because if it wasn't for people opening a door for me mm -hmm. or holding a door open or reopening a door that was shut, slammed, locked, dead bolted, <laughs> um, then I wouldn't be here right now. You know, a lot of us think it's just tenacity and hard work that gets us where we want to go. It's not. It's a, a series of kind events and kind people that gets us there. And it's more than serendipity, even though I love that word. Mm -hmm. It really is very strategic because the kindness of others can be signposts for us for where we're meant to go, where we'll find the most fulfillment and where we will be in our sweet spot ultimately. <laughs> I, love it. I love that kindness is a, is a verb too. I'm thinking of that. Like mm -hmm. kindness is an action, like you, mm -hmm. you know, an act of kindness. So yeah. Um, my last question, which I like to ask everyone is what does rock solid mean to you? Well, I love what you said at the very beginning that rock solid was, you know, your authentic self, your best self, your highest self. And to me, you know, I, I can't help but like 
think of whenever I hear rock, I think of Rocky and my name is Adrian and I've heard yo Adrian my whole life, but <laughs> I can't help it. It's like rock, Rocky, but rock solid, you know, we want to be firm and steady and anchored. We don't want to be somebody who gets knocked around in life. And, you know, I have found that when I know who I am, that's what makes me rock solid because I can't let you tell me who I am. If that changes at any point, then that means my identity changes. And so I have to be so assured. And with that rock solid hope and identity, I really am unstoppable. I love it. Well, congratulations with everything. I look forward to your rising career. I think you're oh, just getting you. started. You have decades more ahead of you, which I'm so excited to watch you shine. And thank you for being a leader in this space. It's, it's oh, amazing. Thank so. you. Thank you for the platform. Thank you for the time. All right. Bye. Be well, Crystal. Thanks so much. <laughs>